This is The Boulder Artist, conversations with impactful creatives to inform, inspire, and involve. Brought to you by the Novo Art District, hosted and produced by Becca Salisbury, recorded in the Maidlife Sound Studio, music by Hank Church, and mastered by Connor Weisberg. So today we will have two special guests, but first I'm speaking with Rebecca Domenico who is most famous for her installations and work using butterfly wings and mica, but also creates other multimedia art, writes poetry, and nurtures an extraordinary garden. Her work has shown in the Boulder Museum of Contemporary Art, in downtown Boulder, at the Denver International Airport, the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver, Redline Denver, Denver Art Museum, San Francisco Craft and Folk Art Museum, the Washington Post, the New York Times, Westward, and the Daily Camera, Additionally, Rebecca has worked in philanthropy and the arts for over 30 years, currently as the president of the Scintilla Foundation. She started the Swoon Art House, which is part of the Swoon Bimoka International Artist Residency, and has been a member of the Art Knots Artist Collective since 2007. Rebecca, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. <laughs> so is it correct that you grew up in Northern California and then came out to Colorado to finish your Bachelor of Arts in English Literature after studying at Claremont College and a university in Nepal? That's right. Okay. That was my trajectory, how I ended up in Colorado. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. What's the story with university in Nepal? Nepal? Um, Well, when I was in high school, I went on an exchange uh, program, and it was in Europe and Germany, and the father of the family that I lived with was a mountain uh, climber and a photographer, and he went on a trip to Nepal and came back with these beautiful photographs, and somehow in my mind, I always had it, some, you know, bucket list that I would go to Nepal, and when I went, when I was applying to colleges at Claremont, they had a program, uh, exchange program to Nepal, and so I went there for nine months and lived with a family in a little mud hut and wow. hiked in the Himalayas and yeah. Wow. Yeah. That sounds incredible. Yeah, it was. It was amazing. It was life changing. Wow. Yeah. And I found this quote. Um, you once said, the way you cook, make social connections, speak, dress can all be informants for living a creative life. I love this. Um, I have felt this, right, in how I present myself, how I've made a home, even how I make meals, make coffee in the morning, my running. Um, So I wanted to ask you what you think it means to be an artist and how that definition relates to if someone supports themselves financially as a professional fine artist. Well, you know, of course, the the being an artist can sometimes mean you're, you know, you're born an artist and which is true in my case, but it could also mean you develop into becoming an artist. Some people don't, you know, don't decide that until late in life. Um, but it definitely is a way of life. I don't think it's just a profession, a profession. And, and that quote is true. I do often think that. And in my teaching, I, 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 I've taught that idea because sometimes people will say to me you know how did you get to be so creative and and I'm not creative and and I always think that's that's not true because everybody is it's just what what it what is it in is it you know how you raise your children is it you know is it your garden is it your house is it you know like the work that you do out in the world or what whatever it is, there's always creative components to it, and and maybe when you're an artist, you you have a tendency to think about it all like that, you know, not a separation between art and life. And um, we seem to live in a culture that really likes to put things in boxes, you know. Oh, you're like this, so you must be over there, you know. Um, but my experience of that is actually much more kind of comprehensive where everything could fit in that category and uh I don't know it's more fun to live your life that way too (laughs) I agree with that yeah yeah I love that um I I absolutely agree that everyone is creative and um you don't necessarily have to be a professional artist to be an artist yeah and I, I also think that like sometimes I think 
that it's not the ideas that make you an artist. It's whether you do them or not. Mm. And a lot of the things that I do require years and years worth of, you know, uh, very repetitive tasks. And I happen to love those kind of things. So for me, it's like a meditation or, you know, it's, 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 it's not uh mundane or some task that I have to complete, but it's a, it's a way that kind of calms me down and, um, and acts as more meditative. And, and so I don't feel like, um, I don't, I feel like what maybe separates an artist is that you actually will do that. If it's, if you have two years of making little mica butterfly scales, are you going to do that or not? Cause a lot of people might have that idea, but then do they have that follow through to actually, you know, do it. The maybe right word is dedication, you know, and, yeah. and also like having a vision, like do you, because I think that's what propels you forward into doing those things. If you can imagine, oh yeah, that's what I want to do. How would that, how would that look, you know? And then being a professional, I mean, basically that just means that's what you do, that you do it for everything. Mm -hmm. And, a, you know, most of the artists that I know have all done other jobs. So they, it doesn't mean they're not professional. So maybe they're also a teacher or, you know, whatever else they do. And hopefully you choose something that's not soul, you know, soul sucking. So you can, so it doesn't uh, wipe you out for living the creative life. Um, but that's what, that's what most of us do. Yeah. Did you yeah. ever have another job oh, unrelated yeah. to... Oh, yeah. I mean, I had <laughs> restaurant jobs and sure. working in retail, and I did modeling. I mean, modeling kind of is related, I guess, you okay. know, for artists. And um, I don't know what other jobs did I have. I had a job ironing once. That was some kind of soul-sucking job. Mm. <laughs> um, but, you know, and then I also work for a foundation, so... There's yes. that work. And, but I think a lot of artists are activists, you know, that, that one of the uh, kind of philosophies that goes with being an artist is changing consciousness, changing how people think about things. And that kind of goes with activism. Mm. So I feel like that's not really a separate job in a way. Yeah. It, it feeds into all the things I believe, you know. I love that you brought up changing consciousness. Um I think this ties into my next question. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, it totally does. So I wanted to ask you about your process because seeing your work and reading about your work, I get the impression that you really embrace the, the chaos, confusion, entropy in the universe and just trust that it's all meaningful and it's all connected. Whereas I feel like I spend so much time and energy trying to stay organized, trying to make sense of everything, trying to be really intentional. So I have often chosen design over art because the meaning or purpose or function was more clear or felt more clear. Oh, that's interesting, yeah. But I'm starting to learn how art can have a similar purpose of communicating a certain message or invoking certain feelings or, like you just said, changing someone's consciousness in some way. Um, so I'm curious what you think about that difference between art and design. Like maybe art is maybe accomplishing some of the same things but in a more intuitive way. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you have to have a vision. You have to start with a vision. And, um, and you know, sometimes those are very clear intentions, but then they change along the way. Mm. And so you might, and, and I've had both of those experiences. I've had the experience of, you know, dreaming something and then making it pretty much like the dream. And then I've had other experiences where I thought, you know, I'm going to make a, you know, for instance, a cave. I'm going to make a cave out of, you know, butterfly wings and mica. 
And I have, and, and when I get an idea like that, so I got that idea when a friend of mine, um, Michael Mead, who's a mythologist, he tells these stories that are thousands of years old. They're like, you know, 2000 years old from different continents. And, um, and he tells them, uh, uh, playing the drums in groups of people, sometimes troubled youth or veterans or people like that, people who maybe haven't, uh, don't have access to therapy or not, um, uh, can't access their emotions through therapy. So this is a different way for them to do that. And then he tells the stories and then he gets people to respond to the stories. And they're kind of like fairy tales. They're archetypal and they have these sort of universal concepts and they're, and they're beautiful. They're amazing stories. And I was at an event where he was telling a story. Uh, it was a Native American story about a woman who was in a cave um, uh, weaving the most beautiful tapestry in the world. And when he was telling that story, I started to, <laughs> you know, imagine, oh, like, oh, what would it, if I made a cave, what would it be like? And and so I just started thinking about that. And then I got asked to do uh, an installation at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver. And um, so I thought, well, I'll do that. I'll do that. And my first ideas were different than how it ended up. So it kind of morphed, mm. you know, through that, process of you know putting the butterfly wings inside the mica and then sewing it and all the different you know things iterations and things that I had to go through in order to manifest that piece um you know so there's examples like that and then there's you know other examples of sometimes like I have this thing with my husband where he when and when the, in the beginning when we were first getting to know each other he would tell me well you can't do that that's going to be too heavy or or how are you going to put that through the door or you know no one's going to appreciate the vision of that or you know whatever it was and I and I had to train him I had to say to him look let me dream as big as possible let it be like this brainstorming burgeoning you know extravaganza and then <laughs> and then once I'm set oh I'm making a cave and it's for the museum and it's gonna be like this you know then start saying okay well how are you gonna get it through the door and how big is it gonna be and how much is it gonna weigh and you know mm -hmm. all of that stuff and then you know help me manifest it and I had one of those instances a show that I did at the Arvada Center where I wanted to make this I don't know how tall it was but like I don't know maybe 15 foot uh uh column of little vials of liquid that went in a spiral you know all the way it was called spiral of vessels and it went from floor to ceiling and of course he's telling me well that's not gonna you know those are gonna fall apart the minute you try to um, put them up and transport it because it's too much weight of all those um, mm. little tiny vessels filled with liquid all the way up to the ceiling and I was like oh there's got to be a way to do it and so in the end we built this um cardboard uh, uh tube and i built the whole thing around the cardboard tube and then transported it to the museum and once we got it there we cut the cardboard tube out in sections and pulled it out so that this thing looked like it was just suspended in space i mean it was but then the 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 uh, you know, drawback of that was when we w went to bring it home again, we couldn't put the tube back inside of it. And so the whole thing fell apart on the, on the way home. And, but part of me was kind of like, well, it was sort of like land art or installation work. And it, that's how it, it, you know, it was existed in the world in that iteration. And that was it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it had a finite lifespan. It did. It did. <laughs> yeah. So, so to what extent or how often do you have a specific purpose in mind when you start creating a piece? Um, like what percentage of time or I, I don't know, maybe, maybe more than half the time. I mean, sometimes I'll, something will just happen by, by uh, serendipity in the studio. So sometimes people ask me, how did I get to the butterfly wings uh, inside the mica? And, you know, that was like one of those weird commercials where you you know you fall down the stairs and something lands at the foot of something else and it was a little bit like that because I was making these prints that were made with butterfly wings and then I had some mica that I got from a salvage company and I was making some other pieces with mica and I was and I was always kind of thinking about how do you protect 
things from nature. So things that are kind of fragile and cause I use a lot of um, fragile materials from nature. And so I have to figure out ways to protect them. And so often I would have glass or, you know, things that were over it. And when I saw the mica, I thought, Oh, the mica is like the perfect thing as a protecting uh, agent. Cause you see through it, you know, it's diaphanous, but it also has a shimmering kind of silver uh, textural quality to it. And it's, and it protects you know, whatever is inside of it. And so, you know, if you try to save a butterfly after it dies, it just turns to dust. And so this was a way to protect it by putting it inside the mica. And and so I was in my studio and I'm making these prints. And then I laid the mica down on top of the butterfly wing and I went, oh, there you go. That's the perfect thing. Uh Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. And so the Scintilla Foundation, kind of changing gears, yep. uh, the Scintilla Foundation focuses on the environment, reproductive rights and justice, campaign finance reform, peace and security, and the arts. And the Art Knots use visual arts as a tool to address global issues. Along similar lines, you've said you believe art is a tool for social change. Has philanthropy always been part of your equation, or was there ever a time that you kind of had to prioritize getting your own footing first. Um, well, those are both true. I mean, I was I was brought up in a family of like back from my grandparents' era of philanthropists. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was always like a way of life that I was taught, and 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 I was taught that you always need to give back. Well, you know, and that's mm-hmm. actually what being an artist is about. That too, mm-hmm. it's the same. It's that same. Um, you know. Uh, uh, I don't know what you would call it, like equation of what it means to live in the world is you, you, and it doesn't even have that much to do with resources because you can do it with your time and energy and just what you mm-hmm. think is important. And, um, and so that's always been a part of what I do. And then just actually, doing it as work, you know, running a foundation, it takes a lot of time away from you know, my actual practice, because it's like helping other people, and it's doing, it's doing all of that, Um, but somehow it always feeds into my work, and, and, and for me, I think it has this ability to make me more connected, so I think there is a tendency for artists to, um, you know, hole up in your studio and you're kind of the, the metaphor is kind of your head is in the sand, and you don't really know what's going on in the world, and, and, um, and I think you have to guard against that. You have to, you have to, you know, be careful that you're not doing that. And a, a great way to do that is to, especially given all the things that are going on in the world and what dire straits we're in, <laughs> you just look out in the world and you think, okay, here's what I could do to help. And, um, and so I think for me, it's sort of been a saving grace in a way because I don't feel as self-absorbed. I feel more like, um, uh, just being of service, I guess. And that, and that feels like, a, you know, that feels like a really important purpose to have in your life and, and something that, you know, you put your head down at night and, and you can think, okay, well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do every little bit that I can. And, you know, maybe it's, maybe you're standing at the top of the dam breaking with your little droplet and you're going, oh, this will be good. And that will be good. <laughs> Given the, you know, the size of this, the, of the, contribution that you're making but i feel like it's the hundredth monkey you know it's if everybody does a little bit then we'd live in a better world and there might be more um thoughtfulness about the mess you know how you get into a mess to begin with is by not thinking about what the long-term effects of things are you know and you know so that's the part about changing consciousness that if you present art in a way to the world that isn't so much like from your head but it's more from your body and your soul and you present work in that way then people really get it you know they get it viscerally they're like Mm. oh like that's what that means you know yeah and you know so I try to do the same thing with my work that I do with the philanthropy which is you know kind of shift the way people might think about something you know yeah yeah Yeah. I mean I feel like there is a misconception sometimes that, like you said, art is a solo um, pursuit or pursuit, something. Yeah. yeah. But um, I mean, I have to say coming home from the artist talk that we were both at on Thursday, which we'll talk about here in a minute, um, 
I just had this thought of art and community are so entwined and what would art be without community and vice versa? Yeah, I think Um, that's really true because you don't create work in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. You know, you want you want to express yourself in in the world. Mm -hmm. So you want to share with other people, too. And it's a I mean, it's the most human thing, the the um, ability to make work, to make art, you know, make music and dance and visual art poetry all of it you know it's it's how it's what makes us human Mm. and i have to say too that i so admire your investment in boulder because i think most of us know that boulder lacks diversity and our art scene isn't as well known as um, some places nearby like denver so a lot of people I know a lot of people who just end up moving to Denver or maybe they live in Boulder, but they still go to Denver mostly for their involvement in the arts. Mm -hmm. Why is it important that we invest in the arts and culture here in Boulder? And do you see the art scene in Boulder continuing to grow? Mm -hmm. Um, Well, the last question is, yes, of course it's growing because when I first moved here 30 plus years ago, uh, you know, and coming from the north of San Francisco area where there was so much amazing culture, I was kind of like, what? Okay. <laughs> and even Denver, I thought was a little bit, you know, sketchy or sketchy, maybe isn't the right word, but not exactly cutting edge, you know. And um, and I guess at the time I was thinking, well, I'll get a lot of work done, which I, I think it's true of artists who live in places where there's not a big art scene. But that has certainly changed. And um and and I think, you know, it's up to the people who live in those communities to keep growing their, uh, you know, in, enriching, enriching the environment with more cultural things in all different aspects and not think of it as some kind of competition, you know, mm-hmm. um, that all of it adds, you know, it adds to the whole experience. Um, and then as far as, you know, investing in Boulder as opposed to Denver, I mean, I'm not sure that there's any place in the world that doesn't deserve a vibrant cultural life. And, you know, that is one of the things about Boulder that, uh, is bothers me the most is the lack of diversity. And, um, but I think that art again can change consciousness and by having diversity, uh, you know, not just an ethnicity of the people and artists who are around you, but practices. So you, 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 uh, open the doors to, embracing or looking at all different ways of being in the world and that means oh then you're going to have the diversity of people will come you know based on that feel that feeling of being accepted and that feeling of that being embraced in in the culture that you live in um you know and and in my view that should be happening all over the world and we're kind of doing that with our residency too because we've tried to get people from all different continents and uh, cultures and different uh, types of artists different mediums and you know different uh, genders and you know just try to uh, have that be as open as possible to all the different manifestations that um, art can come you know, and affect people that you live around. So you bring that to a community that also um, exposes the community to a sense of diversity. Cause I think a lot of, a lot of the times what people, what it is, is fear. It's fear based. People are afraid. They look out and they think, well, that, that person's not like me. And really when you, when you expose people to that, then they see every, that it's like universal and everybody, you know, everyone has blood and everyone has, fears and joys and sorrows and you know all of it and they come from cultures where there are similar things universal things and also things that are very different and um and all of those can be ways to change the way you look at the world and yeah so absolutely yeah i think um everything you said is is so important and you know yeah, so, I mean, I'm not sure I would just say, well, Boulder deserves to have this kind of community because, I mean, I happen to live here and it is and it is a beautiful place and sometimes people, they, you know, they would spend a ton of money on their bicycle or, you know, the their outdoor life is really important to them and they don't think as much about the, uh, you know, cultural uh, uh, life 
But when you think about societies, they're remembered by their culture. They're remembered by their music and their visual art and their poetry and, and, and all of those things are the lasting, you know, the, uh, yeah, the, the part of the culture that is eternal, I guess. Remains. Yeah. 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 Um. Thank you for listening. I hope you gained something from this episode. The Boulder Artist is created in partnership with the Novo Art District, whose mission is to elevate the arts in Boulder, continue the artistic and economic development in North Boulder, and support and enhance the local community. Take care and catch you next time. Thank you.